right, so thank you everybody for joining us this morning for Germ Warfare Enhanced. I am Stephanie McCowett. I am the, from the Datamark team and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to let everyone know that we are recording this session. All attendees have been muted for quality assurance purposes. Um, we do encourage questions through the use of the chat in the Q&A section of our platform. We'll share your questions with the presenter during today's session at the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, at the end of the session during the Q&A portion. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Jenny Mason. Jenny has worked with first responders for 15 plus years, marketing, selling, installing, and maintaining 911 dispatch furniture, as well as training on how to keep a healthier work environment. She's the CEO of CCS, Communication Center Specialist, a long-term member of ACO International's Commercial Advisory Council, CAC, and the CAC representative to the TEC and co-CCAM for the state of Florida ASCO chapter. Um, so without further ado, take it away, Jenny. Hello all, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to do this and thank you for that awesome introduction. I don't even know that I can do better than that. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get my uh, screen shared here. Uh, this is my first time doing this, so bear with me. If we have a couple of little glitches, hopefully we won't. Um, but we are going to have a great day. We're going to be talking about germ warfare enhanced. I wanted to thank um, Datamark uh, for putting this together, as well as thank all of you telecommunicators, especially during um, National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week. I hope you are all being pampered galore. And with that, let's go ahead and get started on germ warfare enhanced. Let's recap some of the things that you have in your comm centers, just to get a start. So some of the things that you see coming up on the screen are probably things you're familiar with. Popcorn, Cheerios, straws, cheese puffs, nuts. We use chapstick while we're sitting there to keep our lips moist. Um, snacks of any kind. And then, of course, there's this. That's right, toenail clippings. We find them in 85% of the centers that we service, and it's pretty gross, but it happens. So if you don't think it's happening, you're wrong. It is. Got pests? These little beauties were pictures that we took within comm centers uh, that we have been into, and I'm sure lots of you see these as you go into your center. These are just the dead ones that we found. We've also found some live critters as well. Although not well known, insect body parts are an especially potent allergen for some people. These are the dead ones, but the live ones are also adding biological contaminants with their droppings. So they can be a real hazard uh, for someone who might have a compromised immune system, especially something that has to do with their respiratory system. It can also cause sneezing and coughing in people who don't even have general issues with it. See that back of that door? That's definitely not paint. It kind of looks like spray paint, but it's not. It's actually a dust and dirt buildup that has accumulated on the backside of that door. It's pretty gross. Um, you'll also see at the base or the bottom shelf of this console desk, it looks gray with maybe some little squiggly lines on it. Yeah, that should be black as well. It should all be black underneath there. So this is pretty common in 911 centers. Um, you guys keep it dark in there for a reason. It's so you don't have to see all of this that's working underneath you. This is another great visual of what we find under um, desks and comm centers all over the United States, as you can see on the picture on the left. That's a pretty significant dust um, and debris buildup that's sitting right at your feet. Um, the right side is what it should look like. The left side is what we found. Spills that happen on top of the console desks. Sure, the top part might get cleaned, but as you look down below, we find remnants of things um, that have been spilled, things that have been dropped, um, whether they attach themselves to, in this case, a leg set on a console desk. It also goes into the carpets and the PC. And look at that beauty. That is not a happy uh, computer, not at all. You can see the accumulation of dust and dirt right there at the back side of that console where it should be pulling air in to keep the PC cool. 
that debris, if any type of breeze comes by, it's getting pushed up and into the air and you're breathing it in. And how well are these things working anymore? So how safe does that look? I can tell you I'm pretty sure the fire marshal probably wouldn't think that's the best thing to see within a 911 center, especially when it should look something like this. And that actually is the same picture. It's the same unit, um, one with all of the dirt and dust collection and one without. And we're going to talk more about this scenario a little further along in the presentation. What's this? If you're raising your hand out there and guessing that this is a power strip, you are absolutely 100% correct. Um, this is opposing ends of a power strip and what it should look like. This is not good. Again, if a fire marshal comes in, I'm not sure this would be a positive for them. We actually could tell that this uh, power strip was active. Um, in the picture down below, you can see the light is lit over there on the right, and we could just barely see a tiny little bit of light coming out of here uh, as we were servicing these desks. PC sweaters. In case you didn't know it, PCs don't need sweaters. <laughs> These are pretty disgusting and things we see in the comm center all the time. So you'll note here we have a white keyboard. Probably don't see those in centers much anymore. They kind of went away from manufacturing keyboards in lighter shades simply because they don't really cover the dirt, dust, and debris well. It, sto it shows very aggressively on it. Uh, with this, you can see that we have taken a, a narrow, sharp object and run it down just the base of that keyboard tray. And you can see all of the dust, the giant dust bunny that's come out of just that one little portion. Uh, and there's usually a buildup above that as well. So you want to take a guess at what this is? I've been using this in my presentation for a long time. So I know a couple of you are like, I know, I know. <laughs> but this is basically sunflower seeds, saliva, and skin residue. We actually removed all of the keys from the keyboard. And the telecommunicator that utilized this keyboard on a regular basis would come in every day and set two bowls up on either side of the keyboard. One would have sunflower seeds in it and the other was empty. And all day long, she would pick the sunflower seeds up, put them in her mouth, crack them, and then put the shells in the other bowl. So this basically is an accumulation of, goodness sakes knows how long this took for this to accumulate in this fashion, but I can guarantee you that this keyboard was definitely not functioning at its best and you rest your fingers on it. Here's another picture of a keyboard that we had removed all of the buttons, and you can see all of the dirt, dust, and debris where you are actually pressing into that as you type every single day. It's just a reminder to make sure that um, you are either swapping these out on a regular basis, keeping them clean, um, using the air blowers is definitely not recommended because then you're just blowing all of that all over the place. So if you're gonna use an air blower, do it outside. Um, even that's not great because then these particles actually end up inside the buttons and it makes it hard to actually utilize it. Um, I know a lot of centers actually are doing swap outs of keyboards where each individual person has their own keyboard trays and they plug and play as they come to work every day. So let's just spell it out. It's pretty gross. It's yeah. But we're going to cover germs in this section. We're going to talk about bacteria, we're going to talk about fungi, and we're going to talk about viruses. So let's dig right in. Bacteria. What are they? They're tiny little one-celled creatures that get nutrients from their environment in order to live. There are 40 million bacterial cells in one gram of soil and 1 million bacterial cells in a milliliter of fresh water. Sorry if you had to go to the bathroom. That uh, waterfall probably didn't help you. <laughs> the good. Bacteria, there's actually some really great things about bacteria. Bacterial infections can be treated with antibiotics. Bacteria can be used to degrade a variety of organic compounds used in uh, waste processing or bioremediation, which is the use of a microorganism uh, metabolism to remove pollutants, and they tend to use it in oil spills as well. So not all bad, unless you're sick. The bad part of bacteria, 
There are many things within the 911 center that cause bacteria. One of my favorite places to find just hordes of bacteria within the 911 center are what I like to call the funky chairs. Um, usually these uh, all have spills, they have sweat and whatever else creates really a wonderful environment for bacterial growth. And they cause the smell and nasty chairs that usually end up retiring to the chair graveyard. Bacterial growth can also be increased by warmth and sweat and large populations of these organisms in dispatch yeah. are caused by body odor. It's true. Um, so bacteria, not only can it cause a pungent smell that may not be pleasant to the nose, it can also cause things um, like disgust, disengagement, anger, um, low morale, and worst of all, of course, is when you get sick because of exposure to some of the bacterias that are living where you're working every single day. Fungi. No, not fun guy. I mean, fungi. Fungi are actually multi-celled plant-like organisms that cannot make their own food from soil, water, and air. Um, they basically live in their own food supply and simply grow into new food as the local environment becomes nutrient depleted. They actually live everywhere. Um, they are in the air, the water, the land, the soil, um, on plants and animals. Um, some fungi are super microscopic, while others are so big they can extend um, for thousands of acres. Actually, the largest uh, living organism is a fungus that lives in uh, my home state of Oregon. Um, it covers 2,200 acres, and it's at least 2,400 years old. It's actually called a honey mushroom. Um, and fungi is actually used in um, food preparation like cheese, beer, wine, mushroom, truffles, the yeast that's utilized in bread. So there are some really good things that we get out of fungus, including um, medicinally. Antibiotics are created by fungi as well as organic acids. So there's some great things that come from fungi. But then there's the bad stuff. The debris that causes mold and mildew and when these items are not cleaned up they deteriorate and they cause a real mess in the comm center indoor molds can cause a variety of symptoms including sinus irritation difficulty breathing headaches and skin irritations um, it can actually be really bad for the very young and the elderly or people who have compromised immune systems. They've actually linked some of it to um, causing cancer, bleeding disorders, neurotoxicity. Um, so it's pretty, pretty gross. And some of the things you can contract that are fungi basically are yeast infections, ringworm, athlete's foot, nail funguses. Those are all in the fungi family. So viruses, this is a big one. Boy, we've talked more about viruses in the last year than any other time I can imagine. Well, I've been talking about them for a long time, <laughs> but the world population has certainly learned a lot about viruses. Um, viruses are really, really tiny. Um, they are actually 100 times smaller than a single bacteria, so they're very, very tiny. You're not going to see them with the naked eye. Um, there's actually always been a debate going on about whether viruses are living or non-living because they actually have to be inside of a living cell to live and reproduce. So the rhinovirus, it's actually one of the smallest viruses. It's more commonly known as the common cold. It has no real cure. You kind of have to just let it run its course and it can live outside of uh, your body for a whole day. Influenza, the flu. Another one that we see all the time. That one can actually live outside of a host cell for two to three days. Um, and there are multiple types of influenza. So there's actually four different types. The two that we tend to deal with most are A and Bs, um, which are seasonal um, flus that we get. Um, and they usually are the ones that can potentially cause a pandemic, as we've seen with COVID-19. So let's talk about the coronavirus like we haven't talked enough about it over the last year. Some interesting facts that I found out about the coronavirus is why is it called a coronavirus? Well, the name coronavirus has to do with actually how the virus looks underneath a microscope. So corona, which means crown, um, as you can see in the picture on the screen, which is a picture of a coronavirus, 
Um, you can see that they're normally circular viruses that have these little florets or crowns that develop on the exterior. And that's why every virus that looks like this falls in the coronavirus family. So what are they? And some of these things, you know, we've been talking about, again, the media has definitely been talking about these a lot, but coronaviruses are in a family of viruses that can cause illnesses such as the common cold, severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, um, the Middle East respiratory syndrome or MERS. So they tend to be viruses that attack our respiratory system. The coronavirus is also considered uh, an enveloped virus. And what does that mean? That means that they're able to stick to surfaces, but they're also to be able, they're also able to be killed by disinfectants. Um, and they're so tiny, it's not like you're gonna see them. So you wanna make sure that you're obviously disinfecting on a regular basis. So why is the coronavirus so bad? Why did it end up being so terrible? Well, our immune systems had never seen this particular strain of virus before. So we hadn't developed any type of immunity. Um, and any underlying issues, um, it, it would actually exacerbate any underlying issues that you had. So this resulted in a virus causing more cellular damage and producing more inflammatory cells. So for people with decreased immunity, due to medications, a specific condition, or from aging, the resulting COVID-19 disease uh, has been a much more serious virus than some of the others that we've seen. Let's go through a day in the life of a virus. This is always fun. Just to see how these little babies get going. So your coworker sneezes while entering uh, info into CAD. You take over at shift change, nothing's been cleaned. That virus particle that he sneezed out is alive on the keyboard and other surfaces. You type, use your mouse, raise your console, and then you scratch your nose, touch your face. And that tiny little virus has now attached itself to cells lining um, the sinuses in your nose. So as you can see on the picture here, that pink purple square, that it would be your healthy cell. And the tiny little, what looks like a tall spider, uh, that is the virus. It's basically attached itself to your healthy cell. In the next picture, you can see where it is entering. It's basically pushing its DNA, or better known as RNA, into your healthy cell. And then it's replicating itself. So it's making all of its own parts and pieces. Once it replicates itself, it, go ahead, it goes ahead and it assembles a whole bunch of viruses, just like the one that entered your healthy cell over here. And once it's done that, then it releases, it breaks your healthy cell, it releases to go and basically infect more cells within your sinus area. Um, with that, you might start feeling a little itching in your nose, you might sneeze, you might start getting your post-nasal drip, which I also lovingly like to call the virus expressway because all of that snot that you have produced is now running down the back of your throat and it contains more viruses. And as it goes along, it's infecting more and more cells. So you might get a tickle in your throat. You might actually have a sore throat, swollen glands. And as it moves its way down your body, it can attack your chest and cause mucus and inflammation and into your lungs, which can uh, make it difficult for you to breathe. And then you are one sick puppy, which no one likes to be a sick puppy. Antibiotics have no effect on viruses. So if you have a bacterial infection, you can take antibiotics and it will help clear up that bacteria. If you have a virus, they can't really give you an antibiotic and have it just go away. In most cases, you have to let your body kind of run its course. They do have things like a Tamiflu, which can help minimize the effects of a virus, but you still have to basically give your body the time, rest, and fluids to be able to overcome that virus when you get sick with one. So when are you contagious? You can actually be contagious with that virus two days before you even show any signs of being sick. That virus is in your body, replicating and moving its way through, and you may not show any major signs, but you're still contagious. 
It can also um, make you contagious for five to seven days after you start showing illness. So when you look at a 14 day quarantine, you know, 10 to 14 day quarantines that they have out there nowadays, they're doing that because oftentimes if you're infected by someone, it could be two to three days before you show signs. And if you're in a group of people, you could literally have a scattering of people over the next five to six days showing illness. So they want to make sure that they're keeping you away from everyone else so that you're not continually um, passing that virus along to everyone else. Prevention. What can you do to help you and your team stay more healthy and keep yourself from having to deal with really aggressive viruses or viruses at all? Wash your hands. We're going to quickly review the best way to wash your hands. Running water. Doesn't matter whether it's hot or cold, but it does need to be clean running water and you want to make sure you saturate your entire hands with that. We've added gloves on so you can actually see as the soap is distributed onto the hands to make sure that you are getting every second section of your hands as you clean them. So you want to rub your palms together, palm to palm. That's pretty basic. Everybody kind of does that, but we can still see some white in there. You want to do your right palm over your left dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa so that you're getting um, the tops and the palms of your hands. But we're still not completely done. So you want to interlace your fingers palm to palm and go ahead and rub in and out of there, making sure you're getting the side of your nails. You want to back of your fingers to the opposing palms with fingers interlocked and really get in there and get to those fingernails within those areas that you might not see. Thumbs, of course, we want to do a quick rub around the thumb area to make sure that we are getting all of that. This is sort of an extra that you don't always see, but the next one is taking and doing a good scrub on your palms with the opposing fingers. This is great because a lot of the bacteria can get um, embedded in those cracks and crevices within your hands, and this actually can help get that soap in there. And then the last thing, of course, you want to go ahead and do your wrists. Now, I've trained before on this, and you definitely want to make sure that you're washing your hands for a total of 20 seconds. I guarantee you, if you were following all of these steps, you are definitely doing it for 20 seconds. Once you finish doing all of that, you want to go ahead and rinse that soap off with that clean running water again. You want to use a one-use towel to either dry your hands or a dryer if possible and utilize that towel to turn the water spout off as well. That way you're not recontaminating that. And there it is. Pretty simple, something we learned when we were very young, but oftentimes we've gotten away with. I think over the last year we've probably gotten better at it. But keep up the good work. Make sure you wash your hands frequently. What if you're in a space where you don't have soap and clean running water to wash your hands? Well, we've got hand sanitizer, and boy, is it out there in force <laughs> these days. You can literally find hand sanitizer in any, almost any public place that you walk into. And if you were to question people on the street, probably eight to nine out of ten of them would have hand sanitizer on them. So what is hand sanitizer? Is it good for us? Is it bad for us? If you're going to be using a hand sanitizer, you definitely want to make sure that it has at least a 60% alcohol content in it. And it will kill um, germs on your hands, but it also kills that good bacteria. So you want to use it when you have to, and if you have the option of washing your hands instead, definitely do that. I love this video, but you really need to avoid touching your face. Your eyes and your mouth are the easiest areas where you can have viruses entering your body, um, which of course increase the risk of infection. It's not an easy thing to do. Most people actually touch their faces 15 to 23 times per hour. Almost half of those face touches will result in touching your mouth, your nose, or your eyes, which are the easiest pathways for bacteria and viruses to enter our bodies. Hand washing can limit the spread. However, we touch our faces so often that the odds of recontaminating our hands between washings are extremely high. All it takes is touching a doorknob or a similar surface. 
and you're in the danger of uh, infecting again. So trying to break some of those habits. Here's some things that maybe you can do that might help you keep your hands away from your face. One would definitely be um, keeping your hands hands busy with an activity or wearing a ring or a bracelet to play with, something that can distract you from bringing your hands up to your face. Two, you can put up a reminder notice, maybe a sticky note somewhere that says, remember not to touch your face if that's your thing, if you're a reminder person. The other is using a, a scented hand sanitizer or soap or lotion to help you remind you to keep your hands away from your face. So anytime the smell gets near your face, you'll remember, whoa, I need to stop and put my hands down. Um, if you can sit and interlace your fingers, that one can also help you obviously keep your hands from touching your face. Um, and another way is to wear gloves. However, um, it's a good physical reminder. However, they can also pick up germs. So when I see people out there that are wearing gloves as they're walking through grocery stores and they're touching everything and then they're touching their faces with their gloves, your gloves are just like your hands. They can also pick up bacteria and viruses um, that are on surfaces. And the minute they've touched that, then they're infected with that. And then you touch your face and here we are, we're all in the same type of circle again. So you definitely want to avoid touching your face. <laughs> Most people cough and or sneeze into their hand. It's a habit we got into. I suppose it's like human nature, kind of just easy. You feel it coming on. The first thing you do is you put your hand to your mouth, which as polite as that is, because at least you're not allowing the particles to spew into the air um, where they can be redistributed. However, I have yet to see anyone run into a bathroom or run to find hand sanitizer the minute they finish sneezing and or coughing in their hand. So any sneezing that you've done in that hand, those germs are now sitting there waiting for you to touch other surfaces, which will infect those surfaces, which could potentially infect coworkers or anyone else that happens upon those spaces moving forward. So what do we do if we can't sneeze into our hands? We need to sneeze like a vampire. You know that classic vampire stance from all the vampire movies where they bring their arm up to shield themselves from the sun. Same sort of concept. You're just going to bring it up, cover your nose and your mouth as you're sneezing. And what that will do is one, it eliminates it being um, blown into the air. And two, it eliminates it from putting it onto your hands that you will more than likely be touching items with. So again, really important, if you have to sneeze, sneeze like a vampire. It's great. So vaccines. A lot of talk about vaccines. Um, and I honestly didn't know that much about vaccines other than, yeah, I get a flu shot or I don't get a flu shot. And I get a flu shot to keep me from getting, you know, a more severe flu. Well, flu vaccines, seasonal flu vaccines and COVID-19 vaccines are totally not the same thing. But that being said, there's a lot of similarities to help you understand everything a bit better. Your seasonal flu uh, vaccine generally is made up of a cocktail or a combination of varying viruses that they may believe are going to hit hard during that season. Sometimes it's a hit, sometimes it's a miss. Um, whereas COVID obviously is a designated vaccine specifically for a particular type of virus. So when it comes to vaccines, you can expect any vaccine. You can expect sore arm, fatigue, headache, fever. Those are all usual suspects that you'll see with vaccines. In fact, according to the CDC, flu vaccines can cause soreness, headache, fever, nausea, and muscle aches. With the COVID-19 vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, um, they've also had varying reviews. Some people haven't had any side effects. Others have had muscle aches, chills, fatigue, joint pain. So it's not unheard of in any type of vaccine to have that type of reaction because they are introducing something foreign to your body and that's your body's way of trying to fight it or envelop it into its system. So while both of the Moderna and um, Pfizer vaccines are um, there to fight COVID-19, they aren't interchangeable. So you definitely wanna make sure you're obviously getting your first and second dose of those from the same manufacturer. There are actually a variety of types of vaccines, meaning types as in how they're developed. The first is an inactive vaccine, which uses a killed version of the germ that causes the disease. 
Inactive vaccines usually don't provide immunity protection that's as strong lived as other vaccines. So you may need several doses over time, booster shots, um, in order to have ongoing immunity against this disease. Some of the inactive vaccines that we use today are hepatitis A, flu, polio, and rabies. The next is the live attenuated vaccines because these vaccines are so similar to the natural infection that they help prevent they actually create a strong and long lasting immune response. So just one or two doses of most live vaccines can give you a lifetime of protection against germ, against the germ and disease that it causes. But live vaccines also have some limitations. For example, because they contain a small amount of weakened live virus, some people should talk to their healthcare providers before receiving them, um, such as people with weakened immune systems, long-term health problems, anyone who's had any type of organ transplant, um, another downside is they need to be kept cool so they don't travel well. So that means they can't be used uh, within countries that don't have access to good refrigeration. Some of the type of vaccines that we see that are this type are measles, mumps, rubella, um, rotavirus, smallpox, chickenpox, yellow fever. Next, we've got the messenger RNA or mRNA, um, which basically RNA is a virus's code like our DNA. So we have DNA, any type of organism or cell has a DNA profile. Well, viruses have what's called an RNA. It's very similar to a DNA, um, only instead of two strands, it's got one and then the latter's going across that. Um, researchers have actually been studying and working with um, RNA vaccines for decades. And so this technology has been used to make some of the COVID-19 vaccines um, that are being utilized today. These have several benefits um, compared to other types of vaccines, including they have a shorter manufacturing time. Um, and because they do not contain a live virus or even a weakened live virus, there's no risk of causing the disease in the person getting vaccinated. Um, and so they are being utilized uh, as a type of vaccine against COVID-19. So this is the next one. I'm not even going to try to read through all of those words, um, but basically they use a specific piece of the germ, like they might use its protein, its sugar, or the casings around the germ to actually um, create uh, the vaccine. Um, they can also be used in almost any anyone that needs them, including people with weakened immune systems and long-term health problems. One of the limitations of these types of vaccines is that you may need booster shots to get ongoing protection against the diseases. And these types of vaccines that we see out there are used to protect um, against influenza B, hepatitis B, whooping cough, and some of the things that you see listed there. There's also a toxoid, a toxoid, which is actually kind of a, a toxin. It's a harmful product. Um, and it's create immunity to the parts of the germ that cause the disease instead of the germ itself. That means that um, the immune response is targeted to the toxin instead of the whole germ. So some other types of vaccines you may need to get a booster shot and ongoing protection against diseases. Um, these types of vaccines that we see today are things um, like diphtheria and tetanus. And the last one is called a viral vector. It's actually um, using a modified version of a different virus to deliver protection. So um, for example, um, like the, the measles virus and the adrenovirus, which causes the common cold. Um, the adrenovirus is one of the viral vectors used in some COVID-19 vaccines, and it's been being studied in clinical trials. Um, viral vector vaccines, um, are also used in COVID-19. Okay, people, I can't believe I have to say this, but I do. It's really important to use your common sense. Don't be a boogie hunter. I know you have tissue paper uh, in your centers that you can utilize. And better yet, go into the bathroom. And after you're done, make sure you wash your hands. The next slide I threw in because I thought it was funny and I think that we've all felt this way during COVID. So let's take a peek at this. Hey Pete, you okay? <coughs> yeah, just feeling a little under the weather. 
Oh my god. Burn his clothes! Take him down! Quarantine him! I Get hate him with you! A fork. What are you doing here? Go home! Burn his clothes! Go home! How could you? You're fired! I know you have all felt the way that last video had. If you have a sniffle or a cough and you're in a public place where there are people, you're terrified that someone's going to think you've got the Rona. Uh, so I just threw that in more for fun. Um, and we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about something else within the center um, that is actually uh, helps some of those germs uh, stay in your center and, uh, and move around your center. So we're going to talk about dust. What is dust? Dust is comprised of so many different things. It's crazy. And depending on where you are geographically, it could be very different. But here's some of the main things you'll see. Human skin cells, pollen, flame retardants, bacteria, human feces, asbestos, pesticides, rodent waste, cigarette smoke residue, dust mites, pet dander, dust mite feces and carcasses, paint particles, as well as wood particles. So as you can see, dust is actually made up of a lot of different things. And about 80% of the material you see floating in a sunbeam, that's dead skin cells. You're sitting in that room looking across, sun's shining in and you see all of these little things floating in the air. A good chunk of that is your dead skin cells, your animal's dead skin cells, your friend's dead skin cells, and you're usually inhaling that. Not good. So what does dust affect? Well, it affects a lot of different things. It actually can lessen the life cycle of your console equipment. There are moving parts in a lot of those, and when that dust gets in there, it can affect its ability to be able to do what it needs to do. Um, it can also cause reliability issues in CPUs and monitors with overheating, and wire damage, keyboard damage, the aesthetics of your center, and honestly, it's a breeding ground for germs. And then, of course, you're sick, which is not any fun. Breathing in the dust within your center can actually lower your immune system's ability to fight off even the basic of basic viruses and bacterial infections that you might end up getting. So remember these things that we talked about? So a computer functions on electricity. I know, I was shocked too. Um, and the inner circuitry actually has to function within a specific temperature and void of moisture. Um, if the heat's too great, the circuits will overheat and malfunction. So to alleviate this, um, com PC companies basically put fans within their units. They're cooling fans. They suck air in to help push air across the circuitry to keep it cool. Um, if there's too much moisture within that, electricity will not flow as it should, and it'll short out. So when dust gathers, as you can see in some of these pictures, it begins to block the fans, one, from cooling off the internal components of the computer. It also is pulling dirt, dust, and debris into that PC. And that dirt, dust, and debris will oftentimes contain moisture. So you're basically adding dirt, dust, and debris and moisture into the circuitry of your PCs, which if we take A and it leads to B, <laughs> basically all of that is going to disrupt its ability to be able to do what it needs to do. Things won't be able to connect correctly. You'll start seeing glitches with your systems. And it's not just the PCs. It can happen with mice. It can happen with keyboards. Um, any type of technology that you have, an introduction of that dust into the system can actually keep it from being able to do what it needs to do consistently like you need it to do. So remember these pictures that we looked at before? The just plug it in there, you're literally pushing all that dirt, dust, and debris right into the connective area where there will be electricity. It's a fire hazard. Dust accumulated on the surface can cause a slow overheat, and in the end, it can cause the cabling insulation to fail or be damaged due to high heat. So dust on an unseen frayed wire, when you have it inside the cabinets and the dust is building up, if that wire starts to heat up, that dust can actually cause the insulation to damage and it can turn into a fire. 
which we have heard of. We've actually had centers report fires based on the fact that they had a frayed electrical wire that had dust collection on it and it eventually sparked the fire. No one wants to hear that the 911 center had to call the fire department because of a fire in the comm center. Long ago, around the time we started growing our own food, humans settled down. We went home, inside. We built permanent shelters to protect us from the elements and keep the wild animals at bay. Or so we thought. Surprise, the animals were right there with us. They still are. This is dust. Zoom in and you find an ecosystem almost as elaborate as the one we left outside, but small enough for us to forget it exists. Dust is pretty much anything small, but the most important ingredient of dust, at least for the purposes of this story, is skin. Your skin, her skin, his skin, tiny flakes that fall off our bodies all day long. Researchers at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco collect and study house dust to find out what exactly makes up this micro-universe. Even the cleanest homes are teeming with tiny, almost invisible roommates. And even more so if you have pets or kids or live on the ground floor. Most homes have over 100 species, no matter how often you vacuum. Not just these guys, but these, and these, and these. Most of these microscopic roommates are harmless, just freeloaders, basically. But one can cause real trouble, the house dust mite. This is like the roommate who leaves his crap around and makes you sick. Dust mites don't bite people. They don't need to. We feed them constantly. Skin flakes are hard to digest. It's like eating hair or feathers. So dust mites have powerful digestive enzymes to break the skin down. Those enzymes turn up in dust mite poop. And let's just say you really don't want to know how much dust mite poop is in your house. When people breathe dust, they breathe in the poop and the enzymes too, which irritate the lungs and can aggravate asthma, especially in kids. Like us humans, dust mites haven't always lived inside either. These tiny relatives of spiders and scorpions once lived in birds' nests. But then, some intrepid dust mites made the jump, from birds' homes to ours. And as our society thrived and grew, so did theirs. I absolutely love that video. It gives such great visuals of uh, what dust is, an accumulation of dust, as well as some great imagery on dust mites and other microscopic bugs that live with us day in and day out our entire lives. Um, there, It's amazing to see that kind of thing because it's not something you're going to see with the naked eye. It's not something you're going to be able to look into your carpet and see tons of little dust mites crawling around in there. They're microscopic. You're not going to see them. So having that visual, I just find is really strong to understand what they look like and how they work and what they actually do in our space, um, which is basically eat dust particles, their own carcasses, their own poop, and of course their main diet, which is our dead skin cells. So I found it really fascinating to find out that the average person, average weight, average height, if you weigh a little bit more or you're a little taller or have a skin condition, this might vary a little bit, but the average person sheds about 10 ounces in dead skin cells every single year. That's quite a bit of dead skin cells that you are accumulating year over year. So let's do a little math just for fun. Um, we're going to talk about a comm center that has 10 dispatch positions. It's manned 24 seven. I know a lot of people would say, well, we have 10, but they aren't all manned 24 seven. Well, for the sake of this little math problem, we're gonna go ahead and say that these 10 positions are manned 24 hours a day. 
And we want to see how much dead skin is being accumulated in this 911 center over the period of a year. You're looking at a little over six pounds of dead skin cells that are accumulating in that center. That's pretty gross. And then when you really take it a step further and you think about centers that are not, sir, you're not cleaned on a, a regular basis, and that accumulation is growing year over year. So as much as we hate the dust mite and they gross us out and they do cause major allergen issues, they are kind of taking care of one little problem for us. They are eating a lot of that those dead skin cells. Um, so we're not literally walking around shuffling through dead skin cells. So they are helping a little bit along those ways. So as gross as they are, we might want to give the little dust mite a little thank you for that. So let's take a look at this picture right here. What you see there on the back side of the desk, I don't know if you can see it very well on your screen, it might look like marks to you, but that's actually an accumulation of dust and dust bunnies. A dust bunny conference, will you? It's all hanging out back there. And in this scenario, where is the telecommunicator? Where's the dispatcher? Oh, there they are, they're right over there. So they're sitting right there. If any type of breeze comes by, any type of air movement back there, those dust bunnies are being swept up and you are breathing that in. So the tele poor telecommunicator sitting there is breathing that dirt dust and debris in. So when they sit down at that desk, more than likely, they're starting to have an itchy nose, um, itchy eyes, they might start feeling congested, having an itchy throat. This is not a healthy environment to work in long term. Prevention. So there are actually some great things that we recommend to help prevent the spread of germs, the accumulation of dust, and they're pretty simple things. One, vacuum. You want to make sure you vacuum every space that you can get to, even the ones that you can't, if you can. Um, so not just the top of the desk but also underneath the carpets, if you have carpets, if you have um, flooring, making sure that they are being swept on a regular basis. You also wanna make sure you dust. No, not pixie dust, although Tinkerbell is adorable. You actually wanna dust, and you wanna dust in all of those, even those hard to reach areas, not just at the surface level, but underneath the desk as well. You wanna try to get rid of as much of that dust as possible. You're kinda of helping the dust mites in a way, um, they're still going to find stuff to eat because you're going to keep shedding skin and they're going to keep dying because, you know, their main diet is carcasses and poop of their own kind. Yuck. Um, but removing the dust as often as possible will definitely help you have a healthier center. And last but not least, disinfect. We have heard so much about disinfection over the last year with the COVID-19 outbreak that um, sometimes it's amazing to me that we don't know even more about it. We know the basics that we need to disinfect, but what does that really mean? So keeping your space clean is really important. And you want to make sure you kind of have this checklist of every surface, your CPUs, your monitors, your radios, your phones, your chairs, your walls, your hot areas. You might ask, what is a hot area? So I've put pictures of a couple of the hot areas on the side of the screen. Maybe it's where you um, move the thermostat up and down. It's definitely um, light switches, uh, doorknobs. Um, one of the worst is the coffee pot. If you have a coffee pot, even if you have a Keurig, the button, the thing you push down on it, those are all hot areas that are touched so often by everyone and forgotten when you look at disinfecting. Um, another thing is communal mugs. Uh, you definitely wanna make sure that those are being washed consistently. And even if you're using, you use the same mug at your desk every single day, you wanna be washing that every single day to make sure that you're not accumulating any type of bacteria in the liquids that you have inside of that mug, cup, glass, whatever it might be. So let's spend some time talking about cleaning versus sanitizing versus disinfecting because they are definitely uh, very different. Cleaning is simply um, aiding in the removal of soil from the surface. Cleaning removes germs from the surface, but it doesn't really kill it. Sanitizing lowers the number of germs on the surface, but it doesn't really kill the hardy ones. Now, disinfecting, on the other hand, actually kills infectious 
fungi, bacteria, and viruses found on hard surfaces. So what type of cleaners and chemicals are you utilizing in your center right now? And are you utilizing those in the correct way? So in centers all over the United States, I see Clorox wipes sitting out on the counters. You've got the green ones or you've got the yellow ones. And what you'll see right on the front of those packages, usually very, very bold, you will see where it talks about being 99.9% to kill viruses and bacteria. It's really reassuring, it's very comforting, but if you look a tiny bit closer, what you'll find is at the end of viruses, specifically, you'll see like a little mark. This one has, um, sometimes it's an asterisk in this particular one, they've used a little cross. Usually that's a sign that there's more information to be had before it will actually kill 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria on your surfaces. So what you have to do is you have to go back and you have to take a peek at the back side of the label. And on the back side of the label, it's going to give you the information that you need to be able to utilize those cleaners so that they will kill at 99.9% um, proof on your surfaces. So one thing you'll see on the back is it will tell you and give you directions on how long you need to keep those work surfaces wet. On this particular packaging, it does say to keep the surface um, visibly wet for four minutes. You will generally find that packaging will have um, a wait time of three to 10 minutes where you have to keep that surface visibly continually wet for three to 10 minutes for it to actually disinfect anything. So there is some time involved in doing that. The other thing that you wanna take a peek at on the back is their kill counts. They will always do this. And what is a kill count? A kill claim or kill count is the different types of viruses and bacteria that this particular product has been tested on to ensure that it can actually eliminate them from the surface or whatever it is that you're utilizing them on. And you'll find all sorts of things back there like you see on the screen, salmonella, all of that. And you notice that this one, I circled it in red, it even says human coronavirus. You have to be careful when you see that on the back of packaging because as we talked about, coronavirus is a category of virus and there are tons of different viruses in the coronavirus category, including the common cold. So when you see human coronavirus, yes, it will kill coronaviruses, but if it doesn't specifically state the COVID-19 strain, you want to be a little more cautious and maybe let that sit time be even a little bit longer or do it more than once to ensure that you're killing that um, virus that's sitting on the surface. So remember, stop. Wash your hands as often as you can with soap and water. Use that hand sanitizer when you have to. You want to make sure you're disinfecting your area, especially those high touch areas, those hot points that we talked about. You want to make sure you're covering your coughs, utilizing your elbow. And if you're sick, you definitely want to stay home so that you're not spreading bugs, viruses, germs throughout your comm center.